Welcome back to Velshin Rule. President Trump calling for red flag laws to help prevent more mass shootings. Now, according to the Giffords Law Center, 17 states have red flag laws, which enable authorities, family members, and others to petition a judge to remove guns from those who may pose a threat to themselves or others. It's called an extreme risk protection order. Now, Seems like a low bar. That's correct. Some of these red flags include uh, threats of act, threats or acts of violence toward oneself or another, a violation of a domestic violence emergency protective order, or threats to use the firearm illegally. Several classmates of the Dayton shooter told the Associated Press there were warning signs about his behavior years ago, including his suspension for allegedly compiling a hit list and a rape list in high school. The shooter's ex-girlfriend now says there were several things that, looking back, she considers red flags, including how he would often talk about mass murders. He showed you video of a mass shooting on your first uh, date. My first date. Um... But again, and it was it was weird, but not weird given the context of psychology. He, he took me to a shooting range. He took you to a shooting range. Yes. And what did he say during this date? He told me that he just it was fun. Mm -hmm. um, just blow off some steam, and there was nothing there was nothing spooky about it then. Joining us now is Jonathan Metzel, professor of psychiatry and director of uh, the Center for Medicine, Health, and Society at Vanderbilt University. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Think Excellent. about all those high school kids in Dayton who said, we're told when you see something, say something, they said something. Right. So this is a tough one because, uh, first of all, you know, it's a go-to for a lot of people who never want gun laws touched, that it's all about mental health. But to the extent that it sometimes is, how do we think about this? Well, I think there are two important things to think about in terms of these e extreme violence laws. Uh, number one is that there are countless stories dating back to 2012, 2013, when these laws came about, of family members being concerned about imminent threats of people who may have been, you know, longstanding gun owners or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, factors like that, but are escalating in ways that were there an imminent threat because of alcohol or drugs or some kind of life crisis. And we know from the rhetoric, of, uh, the, the, the data about shootings that most times, not just mass shootings, but also partner violence, domestic violence, gun suicides, often are moments of escalation. And so mm. part of the issue was, how can we empower family members to have some kind of avenue? It was remarkable before that, that they couldn't they couldn't. There just contact. wasn't anything? There was nothing. And so there are all these stories going back to the mass shooting in California and Tennessee, where I'm from, of family members trying to contact the authorities, but there was absolutely nothing they can do. So number one is, there is a real need for these these kind of laws because the people who see this escalation are the family members. The second point I think is important is that this, these laws were built as a kind of um, compromise position with gun owners, uh, with law enforcement, with mental health people to basically say we're not going to infringe on Second Amendment rights. But if we take away people's guns for a period of 7 to 21 days, a short period, what we can do is get through this crisis while we come to a long-term plan. So I think the second important point about these laws is that they're they're done with sensitivity to the Second Amendment and to gun owners and say this is not a lifetime ban it's a response to a passing imminent crisis let's talk about a different sensitivity you say we should stay away from the term red flag because it stigmatizes the mentally ill what if a person has a diagnosis of some sort of mental illness is that enough for a protective order to say you might not be best suited to have a gun. Well, the research I do actually shows that a mental illness diagnosis is not a, is not statistically related to shooting someone. And so I go through in, in the work that I do, the main mental illness diagnoses, um, depression, schizophrenia, factors like that. And people with those diagnoses actually on an aggregate level are less likely than the general population to shoot somebody else. Then are we misdiagnosing after the fact some of these shooters? When you think of what a heinous act it is, we often say, that is sick. That person must be a sicko. But they're not actually mentally ill. Those are very different things. Uh, th that's exactly right. And so this mental illness diagnosis, I mean, for that reason, psychiatrists are notoriously bad at predicting which one of their patients is going to go on to shoot somebody else. But what's interesting about these extreme violence laws um, is that it's not based, it's not a mental illness diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? In other words, mass shootings and also gun suicides. These are, the laws are very for, effective. For, for, uh, of which people, far more people die from gun suicides. Yeah. Yeah, than, not even close. Two-thirds of our gun death yeah. in this country, and actually the 
data that shows the effectiveness of these kind of laws shows that um, the remarkable success they've had in states like um, um, Connecticut or right. Indiana in reducing gun suicides. And so the important point here is it's not linked to mental illness diagnosis. It's actually looking at the whole context of why people commit right. these kinds of shootings that have to do with passing crisis, substance, um, you know, all these other contextual variables. And so in a way, it's, it's trying to take the sensitivity of this issue and come up with a common sense solution. And I really think that, you know, as you mentioned, 17 states and Washington, D.C. have these. Uh, and I think mm. it would be great to empower and fund more states to have these kind of laws. The point being, as you said, low bar. There are a lot of states where if you have evidence that somebody might be a threat or you have credible fears that somebody might be, th be a threat, short of it, them making an actual threat, you're still you're not in power. Alex, Sandy Hook happened in 2012. They yeah. passed a red flag law in 99. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Right. No, it, and, and so this is an important conversation and one that will be ongoing. Hey, MSNBC fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there and click on any of the videos here to watch the latest interviews and highlights. You can get more MSNBC for free every day with our newsletters. Just visit msnbc.com newsletters to sign up now.